Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here this morning, and we want to begin the service today by hearing a word from our pastor search team, an update. So if you would at this time, give your attention to the screens. Well, good morning, Concord. Uh, my name is Greg Holcomb from the pastor search team. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your prayers. They have literally sustained our team over the last uh, several months. Um, we've had some struggles, especially toward the end of 2020. We've had some personal struggles among the team. Uh, COVID has affected every member of the team, either personally or a family member, extended families. Uh, not quite two weeks ago, Ron Rogers' dad passed away. Uh, Jay Burkett has lost an uncle. Other members of the team have had uh, and still have issues going on with COVID. We've had members of our team have significant health problems. Uh, we've had uh, family members, uh, maybe aging parents, with very significant health problems that have had to be dealt with. Uh, job situations, changing of a job, do I change jobs, all of those kind of things. Um, COVID also is affecting pastors that we talk to. Every pastor out there is going through something to do with COVID. Uh, there's some pastors that don't want to even talk to an, another church because they don't want to leave their church while COVID is going on. Other pastors are not wanting to think about going to a new church, think about the challenges of trying to get to know people during this whole COVID uh, pandemic. So, so some, some uh, pastors don't want to really even think about that. Uh, then there's the, the process itself. We've, we've looked at probably 100 resumes. A lot of those resumes just don't measure up to where we think uh, they should. And then the ones that do, uh, the Lord just has not led us in, in that direction. Um, we've had some pastors that we will, we will find them. We will call them up and say, hey, would you like to talk to us? They'll pray about it and say, no, we feel like God has us right where he wants us to be. Um, some pastors, they'll, they'll come talk to us. In fact, uh, we've had a situation where a pastor came, uh, traveled here, brought his wife, spent two or three days, spent hours with the team, uh, went back home, prayed about it, called us up and said, you know what? We feel like God's got us right where he wants us. Had another situation, very same scenario. Uh, the man came, we met with him, brought his wife, spent two or three days. Um, after that, uh, they went back home, our team met. We said, you know what? We think God has him right where he wants him to be. So, so there's, there's, there's those challenges. Um, we kind of finished up 2020. I don't know why I'm thinking about football today, but I am. And, and it's kind of like we, we went into the locker room at halftime at the end of 2020 and we said, you know, well, we haven't scored yet. Uh, what's going on? We need to maybe, maybe try running a few new plays. Uh, let, let's see what we can do. And so we came up with some very specific things that, that we are implementing in 2021. Uh, one of the things is uh, 21 days of prayer. You know, we led off 21 days of prayer with sharing our prayer request to you guys. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, we shared some specific personal prayer requests with you. And so trying to be a little bit more open and transparent with what's going on with us. Um, the second thing is we've revamped some of the material that we have. We've got about a 30 page uh, church profile that we were finding nobody really reads that all the way through. And so we've reduced that to a single page of information called Concord at a glance that we now can send out to prospective pastors, also to trusted sources that are helping us in this process. Uh, we're casting the net a lot wider. We're, we've each kind of taken a different state and we're looking into different states and, and seeing if there's potential candidates reaching out to their uh, state uh, conventions uh, in, in that regard. 
Two weeks ago, we asked Larry to come uh, meet with us, and, and what an encouragement that was. Our meeting was at, at our house. Uh, my wife Kathleen was in the back while we were meeting, so she could just kind of generally hear what was going on. So the meeting broke up, everybody left. Kathleen came out and she said, did you guys get anything done? And so that was because of all the laughing going on. So, so that was a great encouragement. And then our last meeting, which was just this past Monday, was, was just a really neat meeting. Uh, we came into that meeting we had received uh, a week ago a really strong resume, uh, so we were able to talk about that candidate. We've been able to watch some video of his sermons, uh, and, and we are moving forward with, uh, with the process of, of getting to talk to him. So we're very, very encouraged by that. Uh, around the room, though, uh, one of the things that was said is, Wow, the number of prayers that have been answered is just incredible. Darren Bryson said, you know, in the past, what I was asking for prayer for in the last three or four weeks, all of that has just been resolved. Job situations have been resolved. Health situations have been resolved. Around the table, that has just been uh, incredible and in, in how that's that uh, that has been taken care of. Um, we, we are all very much honored uh, to be uh, picked for this process that you have entrusted this to us. We also um, feel like you trust us in this process. In fact, Stephanie Lavender said it. She said, you know, guys, the, the, the church body trusts us in this and, and we, we appreciate that so much. That has sustained us so much. Now, again, we, we understand uh, that there's some impatience and, and we feel it too, but I just, I wanna reiterate our task is to follow God, to find his man in his time. And we are committed to do that. Just ask that you will continue to pray for us in this process. And we, we cling to that verse that says, victory is mine, says the Lord. We're gonna claim that and we know that he is gonna be victorious. Thank you so much for your support. Continue to pray for us. Thank you. Church family, I know that you will want to pray for our pastor search team. I know you have been already, and you will want to do that. I want to ask that we take uh, some time in this service to pray for uh, our team members and then our team as a whole and the process uh, that they are following to find the next pastor uh, of this great church, of our great church. So could I ask you just to bow with me in prayer, both those who are on our campuses and those who are joining us online. And let's just pray for a moment for our search team. Would you do that uh, from where you sit? Uh, and I will lead us in a prayer time as well. Father, I want to thank you that you are in charge. I thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne of this universe and that Lord that you love your church and it is your church I thank you for dying for the church and establishing the church I thank you Lord that through you we have forgiveness of sin as we trust you as our Savior and then become part of the body of Christ Lord, you love the Concord Church family. So my prayer is today for our pastor search team. Lord, I know as Greg shared with us just a moment ago that they've each faced individual challenges due to COVID and other situations. Father, I know that they are working diligently and praying tirelessly, seeking your leadership for the next pastor. So my prayer is, Lord, today that they will be encouraged. That they will be encouraged first through the Holy Spirit. And then they will be encouraged through your church praying for them. And Lord, my prayer is this morning that you will bring to Concord Church, a man who will lead this church into the future to continue to reach 
people in this community and across the world with the gospel. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to do one other thing. The pastor search team meets on Monday evenings at 6 o'clock. Could I ask you right now to put in your reminders or on your calendars, on your devices, or if you're still old school, if you'll write it on your calendar, and if you're real old school, will you, will you just write it on the back of your hand? <laughs> to pray for the search team tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. You may be at home, you may be at work, you may be driving. If you're driving, don't close your eyes. God hears prayers with open eyes. But wherever you are, if possible, to pray for the pastor search team. If for some reason 6 o'clock just will not work for you, pray for them earlier in the day leading up to that time. But let's all join together to pray for our search team, to pray for their encouragement, their wisdom, and to pray that God will put on the heart of that man and his family that he wants to lead this church to come and be part of what God is doing here at Concord. Would you do that? Amen? Let's do that for our pastor search team. Well, today we're going to continue our study in the book of Philippians. Uh, if you'll open your Bibles to the second chapter, chapter 2 of Philippians, I, the, the series title is Unchained. The theme is Overcoming Circumstances uh, that We Face in Daily Living. I, today, our lesson is a lesson in unselfish living versus selfish living. Unselfish living versus selfish living. We're only going to read four verses this morning. Uh, we're going to read the first four verses of chapter 2. So would you stand with me as I read? It says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm sure you have heard it said, or maybe you have said it more than one time. If you are a parent, I'm pretty sure that you've at least thought it, probably have said it. You've made this statement. You are not the center of the universe. The universe nor the world revolves around you. You know, literally, for many years, people believed that the earth was the center of the universe. <laughs> for many centuries, in ancient history, people believed that everything revolved around the earth, including the sun. And then astronomers, astronomers discovered that the opposite is true. The sun does not revolve around the earth. The earth actually revolves around the sun. So the thought changed that even the earth is not the center of the universe. And then it was discovered that there are many galaxies and, and uh, uh, many stars and planets and that kind of thing. And uh, I'm not an astronomer by any stretch, not even close, but I love astronomy because I, I, I love the, the study of the stars and the planets and the, and the solar systems in the universe. For this reason, it reminds me that there is a creator God behind everything. That this world did not just happen. That God created it and he put it into place. But when it comes to us as people, we have to realize that, the, that uh, we are not the center, uh, center of the universe either. I, when our youngest, um, uh, our son Adam, uh, was in second grade, he learned that, and he learned it through a very persuasive uh, individual called his mom. Um, Adam, the first two years of school, kindergarten, first grade, had the same teacher, and he loved her. I mean, he loved her, and she loved him. And, uh, I mean, it was just 
two great years for Mr. Adam. And then came second grade. The, the teacher in first grade had actually moved up with her students from kindergarten to first grade, had her two years, but then he goes into second grade, and she does not move up to the second grade. And he did not get the same response in the second grade from his teacher that he'd gotten in the first grade in kindergarten. Still a wonderful teacher, very talented, very gifted, but she just was a different person, different personality. Did not respond to the children the same way. So Adam decided a couple of things. One, he wasn't going to like her. And two, he did not have to do what she said. Now, Adam had a couple of problems. Uh, one, he had a teacher for a mom. Two, the Kula then was a very small community. And every teacher knew every other teacher. And every teacher taught to every other teacher. So my wife learned pretty quickly what Adam's attitude was in second grade. So I walk into the house one afternoon as this conversation is going on. And mind you, let me tell you right now, I walked in the house and just kept walking, all right? I did not get involved. I did not interrupt. I, wasn't, I didn't want any part of what was happening in that room that day. But this is what my wife was saying. Adam, I know that your second grade teacher is not like the teacher you've had the last two years. And we love your kindergarten and first grade teacher. But your second grade teacher is a wonderful woman too. She's a great teacher. She's very talented. And besides, it doesn't matter. She's the authority in the room. And you're going to listen to her. You're going to do what she says. And then she looks at him and says, and look at me. You're going to like it. You're really going to like it. And then she made this statement as I walked by. Adam Wynn. The universe does not revolve around you. And I'm standing there praying, Adam, just nod your head. <laughs> you want to live? Nod your head. Just agree. Well, our son learned in second grade that the universe did not revolve around him. But the truth of the matter is it doesn't revolve around any of us. But so often it's easy to become very selfish. To be self-centered and, and to, to think that way. I, I looked up a couple of definitions of selfishness, and I really like these two. Listen, selfishness is being concerned excessively. Now, did you hear what he said? Excessively. Selfishness is not being concerned for yourself. You, you certainly need to be concerned for yourself. Absolutely. You need to be concerned for your safety. You need to be concerned for your well-being. So don't misunderstand. So selfishness is not being is not self-concern. Selfishness is excessive self-concern for your own advantage, pleasure, or welfare above everybody else. Another definition, selfishness is the tendency to prioritize one's own desires and needs above the desires and needs of others. That's selfishness. Well, this morning, we're going to learn another way. God's way. And God's way is unselfishness. And that's what we're going to see in the lesson very quickly this morning. Number one, we want to understand exactly what I just said. Unselfishness is God's way. Look at verse 1. Look at verse 1. In my translation that I'm reading from, it says, if then there is any encouragement in Christ. It, you can read that in other translations, and it says, therefore, if there is any encouragement. But it literally is translated, since there is encouragement. But this thought is, 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 is not a thought independent of itself. You see, we have to remember that when Paul wrote this letter, there were no chapter divisions. Paul didn't write the letter to, to, to Philippi, to the Philippian Christians, and, and say chapter 1. And then he didn't come to the end of that one and go chapter 2. It's one continuous thought. It's one letter. It's a letter. So what, what Paul is saying in verse 1 of chapter 2 is that we're not to behave like some were behaving that we read about in chapter 1. And we talked about that last week. There were some that were behaving in a very selfish way. There was jealousy. There was greed. There was the desire for attention, and, 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 and there, there, there was the mistreatment of Paul and other Christians. 
So Paul is saying this to us. We're not to behave that way. That's not God's way. Someone has said that the most miserable people are those who care only about themselves. They understand only their own troubles and they only see their own perspective. That's the world's way. But it's not God's way. You see, God's way is different. Let me give you two or three verses that are not in this passage. You may want to jot them down and then look them up later. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 16. Listen, don't neglect to do what is good and to share. For God is pleased with such sacrifices. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. No one should seek his own good, but the good of the other person. Wow. John chapter 15, verse 13. Listen to Jesus. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this. That someone lay down his life for his friends. A very unselfish act. So, unselfishness is God's way. Number two, unselfishness is honors what Jesus has done in your life. It honors what Jesus has done in your life. Now go back to verse 1 of chapter 2. You have to understand what he's saying. When he says, if there's any encouragement in Christ or any consolation of love or if any fellowship with the Spirit, he's not talking about your encouragement, your consolation, or you extending love, not in this particular moment. He's talking about the encouragement, the consolation, and the love of Jesus Christ. He said, if you found any encouragement in Jesus, if you have been comforted or consoled by Jesus, if you have any fellowship with the Spirit who now lives in your life as a result of what Jesus has done for you, then you go on to read, behave in an unselfish way. Did you get that? Behave in an unselfish way. You see, the ability to be unselfish doesn't just happen. That's what we learn here. You and I are saved. If you're a Christian, you're saved because of what Jesus has done for you. Period. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian because of what Jesus has done for you. Died. Sacrificed his life shed his blood, that we may be redeemed, that we may be forgiven of sin. This is what Jesus has done for us. Now, let me ask you a question. Doesn't it comfort you to know that you are who you are because of what Jesus has done for you? That you are who you are, that you can be who you are because of what Jesus has done for you. The love of Christ makes you who you are. And then he goes on to say in that same verse, you also have fellowship with the Spirit. Not only do you have what Jesus has done for you, but when you gave your life to him, you you trusted him as your Savior to forgive your sin, and he entered your life. At that moment, listen to me, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. The moment you were saved, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. And so what that tells you is this, you're not alone. And you don't have to give yourself or in your own energy. You could be unselfish for two reasons. One, because of what Jesus has done for you, which was very unselfish. And two, because of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life that will give, now listen, that will give you the power to do what you could never do. Without the Holy Spirit. That's what he's telling us. So. He's saying that. Unselfishness honors what Jesus has done. In our lives. Let me. Make it very clear to us. In a different way. You can forgive others. Because you've been forgiven. You can be forgiving because you've been forgiven. You can love others because you are loved. You can extend grace because grace has been given to you. You can show kindness because you have received kindness. So everything that characterizes unselfishness can be accomplished because of what Jesus has done. 
And that's very important. So Paul is saying, understand. Unselfishness is God's way, and the way it happens is through what Jesus has done for you and through the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And then that leads to the third thing. Unselfishness brings unity to the church. Look at verse 2. Fulfill my joy by thinking the same way. He says, if all this has been done for you in this manner, if Jesus has shown kindness and grace and forgiveness and love, then in turn, you do the same thing. You do the same thing in the body of Christ. You see, it works this way. You give your life to Christ. You trust Him as your Savior. The Holy Spirit enters your life, and then you become part of the body of Christ, the family of of God. Folks, listen to me clearly this morning. Every Christian is related to every other Christian by the blood of Jesus. We're all related. Hey, if you don't like it, you're related to me anyway. You say, that's okay. I got family members I'm related to I don't like, so I can just throw you in the list. I get it. But no, seriously, we're all related. We're all family. We're part of the same family. We are who we are because of what Jesus has done. And we all became part of this family in the same way. And the family of God's called the church, the bride of Christ. And for that reason, there should be unselfishness in the church. The one place on God's earth there ought to be unselfishness should be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you agree with that? Because we're part of his family. And we're family members joined together. Now, in church, there are two choices. Listen, behave like the world or behave like Jesus. It's that simple. I think very simply about things. I have two choices in my relationship to the bride of Christ, to the church. I either think like the world or I think like Jesus. And there is no greater testimony to a world that's not saved than a church that is unified and the people love one another. You see, people who live in Claremont, Georgia, or live in Habersham County, or, or live in Dahlonega, or, or live in Cleveland, or, or wherever you're watching online, they should be able to say this. I, if they don't know anything else about, the, about Concord Church and the Concord family, they should be able to say this. I don't know everything that goes on there. I don't know all the stuff that they do. But I know one thing, they love each other and they love me. They love each other and they love me. That's a testimony to Jesus. That's a great testimony. In a world that's divided, our world in my lifetime, I don't think we've ever been as divided in the world as we are right now. There's so much that divides us. But there should be one thing that unifies us, and that's Jesus. That's Jesus. It's very clear. So, unselfishness brings unity to the church. Number four, unselfishness is a weapon against the devil. By the way, the devil is real. You don't hear a lot of teaching on that today, but I'm telling you, according to my Bible, the devil is real. Jesus did, had to deal with the devil, and if Jesus had to deal with the devil, you and I are going to have to deal with him too. He's real. And there's, there, there are a lot of weapons, and unselfishness is one of them, and it's a very powerful one. You say, where do you get that in this passage? Look at verse 3. It says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. Hold on to those two words. Did you know there was a time, and you can go back and study this in Isaiah 14, 14 did you know there was a time that the devil was in heaven? That's a whole other study for another day. But there was a time he was in heaven, but he got kicked out. You know what he got kicked out for? Rivalry and conceit. He was conceited. He said, I will do this. I will elevate myself. Rivalry. I will be equal with God. And for that, he was kicked out of heaven. Then Paul comes along in Philippians and says to all of us, don't do anything out of rivalry or conceit. In other words, don't do anything like the devil would do it. Don't do anything like the devil would do it. That's what he would do. Now, I'm going to make two 
statements. One of them very hard, but it's very true. You and I are never more like the devil than when we're being selfish. We're never more like the devil. You say, I don't like that. Please do me a favor. Don't shoot the messenger. Take it up with the author, all right? I'm just delivering the word. But we're never more like the devil than when we're being selfish. But I'm not going to leave it there in a negative. Let me give you the positive side of that. You and I are never more like Jesus than when we're being unselfish. We're never more like Jesus than when we behave in an unselfish way. Wow. Well, number five, unselfishness reflects the attitude of Christ. Look at the th second part of verse three and verse four. Unselfishness reflects the attitude of Christ. Don't do anything out of rivalry and conceit. That's the first part of the verse. Second ver part of the verse, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone, everyone. Remember, he's talking to the church now. That's to whom he is writing. That's who he's writing to. He's writing to the church. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. We should be looking out for one another. You see, the devil acts out of pride, but Jesus acts out of humility. And you're going to find, we're going to find, when we look at the rest of these verses, we're stopping in verse 4 today, but when we look, read the rest of the verses, we're going to find the attitude of Jesus was unselfish. In fact, it starts off, and I'm not going to get into it, but it starts off, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Have the attitude of Jesus. The example of Jesus is to put others first. You see that throughout his ministry. He says, I came to serve, not to be served. There's a time when the, the disciples and Jesus are sitting in a room, and you know, the disciples were pretty competitive with one another. They're like a lot of Christians today. They were constantly bickering, and they wanted to know who was most important, who could get the most attention, and, 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 and this, that, and the other. They were always arguing over that. And Jesus even said to them one time, or several times, guys, guys, stop it. The greatest is not the person who has the, the best seat in the house. The greatest is not the one who's getting the most attention. The, the best is not the one who's getting his way. The best is the one who's serving somebody else. So now he's sitting with them in a room, and all of a sudden he lays a towel over his shoulder, and he washes their feet. The king of kings. Get this picture. The king of kings. Lord of lords. The God of glory who stepped out of heaven and came to earth is washing the dirty, nasty feet of his disciples. And Peter opens his mouth as he always does. He says, you're not going to do that for me. And Jesus rebukes him and says, I must. And then he leaves them an example. What I've done for you, you do for others. You do for others. Heard the story of two little boys who were waiting for for their toast to get done. And uh, it was being cooked one piece at a time. And they were arguing over who was going to get the first piece. And mom saw this as a teachable moment. And she said this. Hey boys, boys, boys. If Jesus were here. What do you think he would do? Then she went on to say. I think Jesus would say. You go first. You go first. And quickly, the oldest boy looked at the younger one and said, Hey, you be Jesus today. <laughs> you be Jesus. I am so glad that when Jesus looked at me, he placed my interest above his, of his own. When he looked at you, he placed your interest above his. You say, what do you mean? That when he looked at us, he saw the sin in our lives that separated us from the Father. And that we had no hope of heaven or our living in this life the way life was intended to be lived. And rather than being selfish and saying, deal with it, Jesus went to the cross. The most unselfish act ever 
committed. I'm so glad he did that for me. Aren't you glad he did it for you? That he went to the cross, unselfishly died, that we may live. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you today for this lesson. And Lord, I, I've got to be the first to admit, I struggle with it a lot of times. Lord, it is so easy for me to fall back into the flesh. And so often I've been selfish and I am selfish so many times. Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness and I thank you for the reminder and I thank you for the Holy Spirit in my life who can overcome that. So Lord, my prayer is for us, the church, that we will act unselfishly. We will love because we've been loved, forgive because we've been forgiven, show kindness because we've received kindness and extend grace because it's been extended to us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give the service back to our campus pastors. But if you're watching online or if you're in the room today, that first point in the message today talks about what Jesus has done for us. And I'm telling you, it is God's desire that you know Jesus is your Savior. And that's an urgent decision to make, not one to be put off. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never trusted Him and Him alone for salvation, I'm going to encourage you and plead with you to do that today. If you're watching online and you would like to make that commitment, you can reach out to us by email or by phone. The number and the email address are there. Reach out to us. Let us help you know how to have this Jesus in your life. If you're in the room, as soon as this last song is done and the host dismisses, dismisses us, there, were, there are going to be leaders from our church standing right here. And you could come today to one of them and say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Or maybe you're already a believer, but you just want someone to pray with you. You've got something in your life you want to pray about or someone you're praying for. You come today. Use this time at, when the service closes for a personal time of prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand at this time. We're going to sing. Let's sing to the honor of Jesus Christ, asking Him to empower us this week to live for Him.